So yeah, I, I want to sort of walk you through my morning, not because there's anything that interesting about my morning, um, but because it's probably not that different from yours, right? So I, you know, wake up to morning edition, uh, put, a, put a kettle on for coffee, um, and go to check the morning news feed, realize I need milk and eggs, I run to the corner deli, pay with a bank card, come back, make breakfast, and I'm reading my morning news feeds, um, you know, sort of what 20 years ago would have meant flipping through the morning papers, but now I do it in my RSS reader, um, and I start checking my email. Uh, my email here means both my work email, so the exchange server to the Cato Institute email, but then also my personal server email uh, to which my Gmail email is forwarded. Um, these are all just sort of in the same box, though, so I'm reading them all at home. Um, I start answering one of them, but I want to jump in the shower, so I hit save, save it to the server as a draft, and also a copy on my own hard drive, take a shower, run back, trade some IMs with an editor about a piece I'm writing, finish the email, send that. Um, and then, of course, the alert I'd set to um, remind me that I had to come here and be on this panel. Um, I'd set this alert in my, in my Google Calendar from the office, but that's synced up to my phone and my desktop at home, so that starts beeping, and I realize I'd better finish editing my notes for this panel. Um, so I save those to my Dropbox, which means they're synced again to my pad so I can read them here uh, and, and you know, remind myself what I want to tell you. Um, run out, get a cab, and just in case there's a rookie cabbie, I check my phone's GPS to remind myself what the shortest route to this hearing room is. Um, so yeah, none of this is particularly remarkable, but what's semi-remarkable about it compared to the equivalent activities 20 or 30 years ago is that almost every aspect of that, except God willing the shower, left a trace on some kind of third-party computer that's not under my control. And you multiply that morning by a few dozen or a few hundred mornings, someone with access to that data, certainly someone with the ability to aggregate and analyze that data and compare it to data about other people, could compile an incredibly intimate portrait of almost every aspect of my daily life. What I read, where I am, who I'm with, who I talk to. And you might think that all of that is at least protected from government collection by the Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment requirement that uh, a search warrant uh, you know, supported by probable cause to believe that evidence of a crime will be found um, before they can start digging through my records, through this incredibly detailed digital biography of me. Um, unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Um, most of that activity uh, enjoys either unclear or no Fourth Amendment protection because of a 1979 case uh, called Smith v. Maryland. Uh, and the, the problem is that, as, as you, you know, probably this phrase is familiar, the Fourth Amendment protects the reasonable expectation of privacy that people enjoy. And the problem is that uh, because of a conception of privacy that uh, legal scholar Dan Solov has called the secrecy paradigm, the court found in that case that information conveyed to a third party, in this case it was the signaling information for uh, telephone records, right? The, who, who had I called? Who had called me? That information, because it had been conveyed to someone else, in this case the phone company, which kept that information for their uh, billing records, um, I had lost my reasonable expectation of privacy in it. It had been exposed to the world as far as the court was concerned. Um, we, what's important to remember about this decision, this is only a few years out from when making a phone call, certainly a phone call across state lines, typically involved actually talking to an operator and telling her or him what number you wanted to be connected to. Um, so as a result, uh, it, it's at the, at the most very unclear what kind of protection all that data, not just the email messages and the IMs sitting on a server, but all the metadata, all the transactional data that's generated in the process of sending and receiving those messages. Now, fortunately, Congress did try to address this unclarity by passing in 1986 um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, as you may have noticed, though, technology has changed a bit since 1986. Um, and the, the categories of the statute don't very well track the, both the technology we actually use now and the expectations ordinary people have about the level of protection that their communications are going to enjoy. And this is a problem for users who don't know how well protected their information is, but I think also for the companies that store that information because the ECFA statute is so incredibly convoluted and complex. Even 
in the eyes of scholars who study it for a living. Just let me give you a, a sort of quick um, sense of, of how the categories of the statute work. So suppose the government thinks I'm up to something shady and wants to get a hold of the email that I sent this morning. So how do they do that? Well, obviously, if they want to come and read the copy that's stored in my home computer, they want to come into my home, um, they need a search warrant. So a search warrant supported by probable cause, describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized, they come in, make a copy, uh, vamoose with it. If they want to look at the draft that I saved, though, under ECPA, the email server that's holding that draft, which hasn't yet been sent, is a remote computing service provider. Uh, so as a remote computing service provider, uh, that means that, the, that basically that can be obtained um, with a, a subpoena um, or a, what's called a 2703D court order. The standard for that isn't probable cause, but, but rather specific and articulable facts to believe that the information would be relevant material to an investigation. It's a much lower standard. They don't even have to be interested necessarily in what I'm doing. They just have to think my communications would tell them something relevant. So the ISP is a remote computing service provider with respect to that stored draft email. Then I send the draft email. Um, travels over the wire, suddenly not covered by the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, but covered by the Wiretap Act. The communication in transit on the wire, if they want to pick it up live off the wire, actually now requires more than a search warrant. It requires what some scholars call um, a Wiretap Act super warrant. It has additional requirements of showing that they have to make. That they've exhausted other methods before they use this intrusive method of a wiretap. Ah, then it lands on the server of the person to whom I've sent it. Now, that person's ISP is uh, an electronic communications service provider, not a remote computing service provider, with respect to that email, which means, once again, to read it before it's opened, uh, while it's in this temporary electronic storage, they need a search warrant, regular search warrant. Then someone opens the email. Well, once it's opened, once again, the email stored on that, other, on that foreign server um, is being held by a remote computing service provider. By opening it, they suddenly were transformed into something else. Um, unless you're in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit has interpreted this in a different way, where it's, uh, where, where so, uh, once again, a search warrant is required, even if it's been opened, until it expires in the normal course. I have no idea what that means, and I, you know, work on this stuff for a living. Um, if you do, g give me a hint. I'm not sure. Anywhere else, again, the lower standard applies again once they've opened the email, or if it sits there for more than 180 days. That's all assuming that these are all service providers to the public. If, however, I'm reading my work email, I may not even know whether I'm reading my work email um, because it's all in one box, then they're able to voluntarily disclose without these compulsory processes, essentially any of this they want when, when the government comes asking. Um, so, uh, to put it mildly, the standards are unclear and inconsistent. Um, I think intuitively what most people would say is that the information about the, in, the contents of the communications that you're sending should be treated in a consistent way, whether they're on your home, on a server, uh, you know, transiting on a wire. It really shouldn't matter. Um, but the way the statute is set up, these seemingly trivial distinctions in where a document is stored or whether it's been opened can influence, in, you know, to an enormous degree, what standard of evidence applies. Um, I think there's a similar trouble with location. Remember, I, men I mentioned as I, I went away here, I checked my phone GPS. And there's actually no clear statutory guidance about what the government has to do if they want to find out where I am, either at this instant or where I've been as my phone checks in uh, when I make a phone call or just move around the city. Um, Different courts have decided different things. There's a 1995 statute called CALEA that says they can't just use a pen register. That's the device they use to get that to from transaction data to get location information. But it doesn't say what they can use. So depending on whether the uh, information they're looking for about my location is prospective or retrospective um, and how detailed it is, do they just want a kind of general area or very precise GPS? Um, 
different government agencies have at different times tried and sometimes succeeded to get that information using a pen register plus that 2703D order that's specific and articulable facts, or uh, a pen register plus what's called the All Writs Act, or the court just basically sort of uh, uses its intrinsic authority, or uh, a search warrant, but a regular search warrant, not one of those super warrants we mentioned earlier. Again, this inconsistency leaves both individuals and uh, companies like Google uh, radically unclear about what level of protection applies. Um, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't make that much sense. Um, there's a similar problem with transactional data. That transactional data is um, sort of essentially unprotected. It gets, um, again, the 2703D orders are sufficient to get most of it. There's in a separate national security context, the standard is actually even lower, although uh, we're, we're not dealing with that here today. Um, and we're dealing with rules that the court created at a time when third-party records of metadata about everyone's daily activities, what they were reading, where they were going, was the exception rather than the rule, where the indefinite storage of records of that uh, transactional information was the exception rather than the rule. Recall, recall that in 1986, uh, a megabyte of storage space cost about $100 each. Um, that's in sort of 1986 dollars, it's closer to $180 in current dollars. Now, I think the price of a gigabyte is at about a dollar for consumers and falling. Um, so that's, I mean, so what we're talking about here is a 10,000, 100,000 fold increase in storage capacity at the same price point. What that means is it's now typically cheaper to save stuff than delete it. Uh, both the transactional data and the contents themselves are now usually stored on someone else's computer indefinitely for 180 days, often much more, in a way that the statute didn't anticipate. <clears throat> um, there's also, I mean, there's also a, a change in the way we're using this technology, right, in ways that the statute didn't necessarily anticipate. Most of us now are on one kind or another of social network sites. Um, these are, again, pretty intimate drafts of the kinds of groups we're members of. And there's a separate line of Supreme Court cases involving membership lists. This comes out of a, a dispute involving a statute that required the NAACP to make their membership list public. And there's a First Amendment interest for ordinary people in the different kinds of groups they're members of, especially if the groups have some kind of politically controversial nature. Um, but also, you know, when we consider that more and more people um, are in effect acting as members of the press in an informal way by blogging or even just tweeting, um, the people they're in contact with are often people they're interviewing uh, or, or discussing things with for future publication as we all sort of become journalists. Um, and so, again, that mirror addressing information, which is much more detailed because, you know, again, the address here now isn't just a phone number, but usually much more identifying. Uh, the addressing information for communications with websites often contain pretty specific information about what we're reading and writing. Um, and so, as vastly more useful information for law enforcement has become easily accessible, um, you know, essentially, law enforcement has, has sought the path of least resistance. And so we've seen an enormous uptick in requests for these kinds of relatively less regulated user information. Uh, and reporting on this kind of request is very spotty. But we do know, uh, thanks to actually a, a smart researcher who's in the room, that, um, for example, Sprint alone processed via a kind of plug-and-play surveillance platform for law enforcement designed to make it quick and easy, um, something like 8 million discrete pings for geolocation information in the past year alone. We know that um, Verizon has at least claimed that they get from law enforcement at all levels tens of thousands of requests for user information. And again, that information now essentially is a full-scale digital biography. Um, and yet, as this information explosion has happened, we're operating under rules uh, you know, made for a time when you know, the only computer you used, if you had one, was like this kind of clunky box on a desk um, that, would, that, would, that would, you know, a fairly limited portion of your daily communications. As more and more of our interactions have moved online, 
more and more are in this unregulated space. And so to both protect privacy and to provide clarity for the telecoms that are trying to innovate um, by providing new ways to use these platforms, I think we need to uh, seriously consider a major overhaul of this now 25-year-old law.